Today is November 4th, 2016. My name is Martin Frank, and I'm here at the Penn State College of Medicine in Hershey to interview a friend, Leonard Jim Jefferson. Jim has been an APS member since 1970. He is a past APS president and recently was elected as an APS fellow in 2015. Jim's research contributions has been at the forefront of providing an understanding of the signaling and molecular mechanisms through which insulin and nutrients maintain muscle mass and thus prevent the consequence of diabetes. Jim, welcome to the Society's Living History Program and thank you for agreeing to be interviewed for this series. Jim, your CV indicates that you were born in Maysville, Kentucky. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your family upbringing in northeastern Kentucky uh, and how you became interested in science? My uh, father and uh, mother were uh, families of the Great Depression and uh, they were, my father was a tenant farmer and uh, I had very little education. So I was born uh, just outside of Maysville. Um, my earliest memories uh, was that my father had moved from there to being a tenant farmer. Um, I remember milking cows and helping plant tobacco. I knew where you were born, Jim, but I hadn't realized that you had grown up on a, on a farm. Yeah, which it was. Uh, Jim, or Chuck told me, which explained to me why you have this god awful <laughs> tractor at your house and why you like going out and mowing the lawn. Well, I was milking cows by hand when I was probably five years old. <laughs> and uh, it, it's, you know, it's an. And when I reflect back on it, it's hard to imagine, uh, you know, starting where my dad was and being where I am. It's just what, what level of education did your dad have? I, very little formal education, yeah. maybe fifth, sixth grade or something. Uh, he, uh, he was, you know, growing up in the depression. Um, he was uh, um, basically a day laborer and learning, uh, earning. Uh, I don't know, 75 cents a week or something, right. I mean, some incredibly awful number. And and uh, he didn't get married till he was 32, and, and that was coming out of the Depression. And and so I was born just after he had come through all that. And um, by the time I graduated high school, you know, he had managed to uh, move from being a tenant farmer to owning a farm, and then uh, another farm, and then uh, the the farm that is still the family farm was purchased uh, when I was in high school. And growing up, it was my mother that really inspired education. Uh, she had been, she was a, a high school graduate, and uh, so she pushed uh, to make sure I did my studies, even though I was devoting a lot of time to the farm. Um, my father had a health problem when I was about 12 or 13, and at that time I had to take over the farm and uh, completely. And I would rush home and, uh, and get on the tractor and do whatever needed to be done. And, uh, even in college, I was uh, coming back to help with the help harvest, help harvest the uh, and the planting, and, uh, and you know I was. I was driving big trucks by the time I was 13 or something. But you think you drive your license? Right? <laughs> no. So I was in agriculture and I studied that in, in uh, high school. Uh, my high school was a small class of 40 students. Uh, the uh, I, I think what inspired me to sort of start down the career path I did was I had a chemistry teacher in high school and uh, I really loved that subject. And uh, so I thought about going to college. Nobody in my family had gone to college. Uh, my father was against it. He wanted me to stay and run the farm. Uh, I finally persuaded him that I would go to a nearby uh, school, Eastern Kentucky University, and uh, study chemistry. and. Uh, come back and work at a local chemical company and still run the farm. Uh, so I, we kind of fought the whole way to the campus. And, but, uh, so once I was in college, um, uh, 
I had an organic chemistry teacher who probably was the other next influence in my life. It was elementary chemistry, actually, the first year, and he asked this question, uh, <clears throat> why does grass grow greener under locust trees? And with my agricultural background, I'm sitting in the back of the room and I raise my hand, and so it's a legume. And so uh, from that moment on, I sort of became his pet student. I guess. <laughs> and uh, he was a frustrated person because he had wanted to go to medical school and uh, had not been able to. and so. He kind of identified students that he tried to direct toward medical school. So from that point on, um, I, my intent was to go to medical school. And in fact, in my third year of college, I applied to a number of schools, including the University of Chicago, and was accepted. Uh, but I was, I had a romantic interest at that time who was also going to go to medical school, but she was a year behind me. And so I stayed for my senior year. Uh, we applied to a number of medical schools and we had actually accepted a place at uh, Bowman Gray, which is now uh, Winston-Salem University. Uh, and then the, the romantic contact uh, broke up around Christmas of my senior year and I'm sitting in my room and I have this application to Vanderbilt that I had not submitted. So I ended up uh, sending it in. and. Uh, and that was the key point in my career development, I guess, because I was interviewed, one of my interviewers was Rollo Park, and he convinced me to come to Vanderbilt in an MD-PhD program. So that really fit me because I didn't have the financial resources. So I uh, ended up going there, did two years of medical school, uh, and then did the PhD part, and uh, uh, I had such a passion for research that I just uh, did not go back and do the last two years of med school. So uh, that's sort of how I got to uh, being, a, being a local farm, naive farm boy is what I tell my wife, but <laughs> uh, to uh, being at Vanderbilt. <clears throat> tell us a little bit about uh, the research uh, you did at Vanderbilt as well as Rallo Park who was really a uh, a uh, stellar individual in your field of research. Yeah, Rallo was an unbelievable individual. He had uh, he had graduated medical school at uh, well, he went to undergraduate at Harvard, and graduated medical school at Hopkins. His dad was chairman of pediatrics at Hopkins for many years. Um, he had gone from sort of his military commitment to univer uh, Washington University to work in the Cori lab, and as you probably know, the Coreys were Nobel Prize winners, and five other people who came through their lab were Nobel Prize winners. So Rollo came from that environment. Uh, when he was 32 years old, he was actually offered the chair at Vanderbilt, and so he became a, essentially straight from postdoc to being a chair. So he was a, a, a clear influence in my life. Not only did he identify me to give me the opportunity to come there, but uh, uh, he was an influence in many ways. The research at Vanderbilt at the time was um, the whole focus was understanding how insulin controls blood glucose. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in, so the, the interest was in diabetes and uh, it was uh, uh, focused on what well, Rollo's early work was, his contribution was defining how insulin actually stimulates the uptake of glucose by cells and at that time that wasn't known it mm -hmm. was known that if you gave insulin blood glucose went down but it didn't nobody knew how it happened so so my work was focused on uh, how does insulin prevent glucose production by the liver and so at that Rollo had just recruited Earl Sutherland to Vanderbilt and Earl had recently at that time won a Nobel Prize for his discovery of cyclic AMP. So I was, my work then was able to in, demonstrate that the action of insulin on glucose production by the liver uh, was mediated by a reduction in the content of cyclic AMP or the production of cyclic AMP in, in the liver. Uh, that it's very interesting, I think, for those of you who are watching this video, 
I would encourage you to go to our website and watch the interview that Jim has done with Rollo Park to learn a little bit more about his career. In 1967, shortly after you received your PhD, uh, you were recruited to the department here at uh, Penn State Hershey uh, by Howard Morgan, who was the chair. Uh, tell us a little bit about what it was like to be one of the five founding members of the department here. Yeah, uh, let me go back and uh, fill in a little bit of the time gap there. One of the tributes of, of Rollo Park was he encouraged uh, people, students, to um, ha have experiences at different places. And I mean, you know, for an example, he had sent me to learn the instant radio immu immunoassay from uh, the Burson Yellow Lab. And, right. and uh, they also, had just. Also Nobel laureate. Uh, well, one of them was Nobel laureate, the other one died before he. Yeah. Burson died before he got it. But I think I owe a lot of my career success to the th things that happened at Vanderbilt at that time. So, you know, he sent me to places like that. To, and so I was beginning to develop a network of people. And uh, one of the, uh, well, Don Steiner was another person that came through at that time that I became friends with, and, and he was also a great influence in my life. But uh, one of the people that came through Vanderbilt while I was still a student uh, was <coughs> Asher Corner. And Asher was, uh, at that time, was at Cambridge University in, in England. And um, it seemed like a wonderful opportunity because Rollo was encouraging me to get experience outside the country. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so I was able to arrange a postdoc at, at, at Cambridge uh, with Asher Corner. Uh, wonderful experience. Um, there were, at, at that time, there were 12 graduate students in his lab. I was the only postdoc. I was sort of a rarity. They didn't know much about postdocs at that right. time. Uh, and you know, I could go down the whole list of 12 graduate students. Uh, all of them have become well-known scientists. Uh, Tim Hunt won the Nobel Prize, which is probably the most notable accomplishment, but uh, many of them uh, excelled in, in science. So that was in between. <laughs> Uh, the Vanderbilt experience and coming to here at Hershey. Um, while I was in England, uh, Rollo had just come through Hershey, accepted the chair, and come to England to visit me. And so while he was there, he offered me a position here uh, on the faculty. So I sort of accepted it sight on scene uh, uh, in uh, uh, I came back to this country February 67, and I came through Hershey, and uh, it was uh, cold. Uh, <laughs> the building was just beginning to be <laughs> constructed, <laughs> and uh, so I didn't even have a place to go at that point, and I went back to Vanderbilt uh, and spent uh, until J July. I, would, I went to Vanderbilt and worked again as a postdoc. Um, so I came here in 67. Um, it was still, the building was still under construction. Uh, my office was in the farmhouse across the street, which is now the Coco Beanery. Okay. Um, and uh, so there were five of us. Uh, Howard had brought myself, uh, Bob Neely, or, or it was James Robert Neely, right. but people know him as Jim or Bob and uh, Warren Davis, so it was Howard Warren Davis, uh, Bob and myself from Vanderbilt, and then he brought Glenn Mortimer here from the NIH, and so those were the five original faculty members in, in the department. You, you said Rollo offered you the job, so was he coming here as? No, I, I, I must have misspoke. It okay, was Howard, Howard. Howard offered me the job okay. on his visit to, to Cambridge, Cambridge uh, okay. just after he had accepted the chair here. Right. Mm -hmm. What was it like starting a new department and the challenges of being part of uh, really a new medical school, right? In some ways it was fun, exciting. I mean, uh, it was certainly uh, challenging. Uh, uh, you know, my 
initial experience in teaching was teaching respiratory physiology, which I probably knew less about than the, the graduate students or the medical students you coming just in. Have to one, one page ahead of them. <laughs> right, so I stayed one page ahead. Uh, uh, it was a small class. The first class was only 40 students, so uh, and. Uh, so it was more intimate. I mean, everybody knew everybody. The, the faculty hung out with the students at a local bar. And uh, so it, it was fun and exciting. But on the other hand, uh, it was also challenging in terms of getting a research program accomplished or uh, initiated and, and getting it started. So, uh, um, but, you know, it, it, you know, Howard was actually uh, determined enough that he was doing experiments. Well, some people say he was actually doing experiments in the moving van on the way from Nashville to Hershey. <laughs> but uh, uh, he uh, actually set up set up to do experiments in the farmhouse that we all were uh, okay. located in initially. So, but I came across campus in the spring of '68 and. Uh, uh, my initial lab was one of the teaching labs, and then uh, by late 68, I had my own laboratory at that point. So. I'm just curious, uh, what was your startup package? Well, my salary was uh, 10000 and uh, there was no startup package. Really? Uh, no. Uh, yeah, I thought it was always that way. <laughs> Jamie rose rapidly through the ranks here in the department and replaced Howard as department chair in 1988. Uh, what lessons did you learn from Howard, uh, observing him and his leadership role that has enabled you to serve as chair of the department for now, for 26 years, you mm -hmm. recently stepped down? Right. Well, I guess one of the things I remember most about Howard is he, was, he had a, a tremendous ability to see directly through to the core of a problem. So all the smoke and mirrors and hidden agendas and so on, made no difference. I mean, he could just see right to what the key issue was and deal with that. And so that was an important lesson, particularly in administration, because you deal with a lot of smoke and mirrors, I might, <laughs> <laughs> I might say. Um, and the other thing, uh, I mean, he was just, uh, he was a no-nonsense person uh, who was dr very driven and, and uh, you know, the, uh, I think, uh, Probably he contributed as much to my science, you know, direction of my science as um, as my learning administrative skills from him. But one of the reasons I had gone to Cambridge was uh, uh, I was inspired by pictures. Even though I was studying glucose metabolism at right. Vanderbilt, I was inspired by pictures of diabetic children. Uh, taken before and after the discovery of insulin in 1921. And if you see these pictures, uh, the diabetic children had lost all their muscle mass. And, and in fact, the definition of diabetes originally was melting down of the flesh into urine. So one of the driving points that, uh, for choosing Cambridge as a place for postdoc was they were just beginning to work on messenger RNA and protein synthesis. And obviously protein synthesis right. was very important in maintaining muscle mass. And Howard had never worked on protein synthesis and but the summer before take before moving here, he took, as far as I know, his only vacation and went up uh, to the northeast and uh, rented a cabin and got every paper he could find on protein synthesis. And so when I came and I, I was coming back from a lab that was doing pioneering work in messenger RNA translation, Rallo, or I misspoke again, <laughs> Howard was um, just beginning to try to think about turning toward protein synthesis for his own work. And so we actually did some collaborative work mm -hmm. early on, and uh, um, it uh, had a great influence. I mean, we, uh, in terms of my direction and his direction at that time. Administratively, I, I guess one of the things was uh, uh, don't ever take no for an answer. I mean, you know, if you get no, just wait and come back another day. And that, that's with <laughs> your faculty or with the administration? 
with the faculty in particular. Okay. Yeah. At faculty meetings, you just you, uh, you you let something get talked out. If it's not going to go through, you visit it at another time. So, okay. <laughs> what have been the greatest challenges you faced as a chair? And I know you were here with the founding. There were five members. I don't know how large the department was when you took over. I don't know how the the size. Well, the. Um, there, the department had grown to probably 10 or 11 faculty when Howard left, but, but he took, uh, there were eight left, he took three, well, two counting himself, there were three, and so there were eight faculty left when I became chair. Um, we grew to 21 uh, at our peak. Um, the, the early years were, of being chair was fun because, uh, First of all, I was hired by Dean Mac Everts, uh, a surgeon from Rochester, and uh, we had a great working relationship, Mac Everts and myself. And uh, he provided, you know, the resources and and the support to make being chair fun. And uh, we were able to grow the department. We became the best funded department in the whole university in terms of NIH funding. Um, I guess the, the fun part began to change about 2000 when there was a change of deans and at that time there was also, you know, instead of departments being autonomous and doing their own teaching and having their own graduate student program and so on and so on, uh, there was a trend nationally and here uh, to centralize things and uh, and so essentially you went from being a part of the leadership to being what I would call a um, uh, a manager mm -hmm. and so I didn't enjoy being a manager so much it was much more fun when I was allowed to be inspirational and innovative in terms of moving forward and so uh, the last few years were not as much fun I guess but I, I, and again I think that's not uncommon when you have a change of deans and a change in the direction of the institution. And, right, right and unfortunately it's in typical of what's happening across the academic yeah, no, campus. It's, right. Right. Like Howard, um, you believe faculty member, it's important to provide service both to the academic, your academic societies and to the, to the university. Can you tell us a bit about some of your experiences and why service is an important component of an academic career? Yeah, I guess uh, my view is that you're a part of a community, whether it's the college or the university or your professional society. So, I felt very strongly that I needed to be committed to the communities that I was a part of and, and, and try to uh, provide support and, 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 and involvement and if you don't do that then those communities are not going to thrive I mean if people in general don't do that they're not going to thrive and so so yes I was uh, I was very involved in uh, obviously the APS, but also the American Diabetes Association and the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation. Uh, the latter two, I was involved early enough that I, with my experience at NIH review mechanisms, I was able to actually help influence the direction of the research programs of those two organizations. Um, so uh, again, it, it, I felt it as a commitment to provide service and it also provides the opportunity to network and uh, and networking is probably the most important thing you need to do to be successful uh, as a scientist. Okay. Jim, you were uh, the 68th president of the APS. Uh, your former chair here, Howard Morgan, was our 58th hmm. president of the society. <laughs> Uh, you served as president uh, after Brian Dooling uh, from Charlottesville and Jim Schaefer from Birmingham, Alabama. Tell us a little bit about your tenure as president and on council and, and working with the, 
the folks around the council table? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the, I, one of the, the most pleasant thoughts is uh, the idea of working with Brian Dooling because uh, he was a charming, <laughs> exceptional individual. And uh, uh, so I had three years of working with Brian first uh, as pe president lag when Brian was president and then when I was president and then past uh, and Brian was past president so we um, so that was fun um, I, what I remember about that time is I came in as president um, at a time when research funding had been f relatively flat I mean which is sort of like it has been in recent years so from 87 to when I became president, uh, the NIH funding. And at that time, uh, the FASAB societies, including the APS, had developed a consensus uh, report to challenge Congress, basically, to increase NIH funding. And, and uh, so uh, I guess one of the things that stands out then is that my time there, not that I necessarily had any influence, but it was the beginning of a number of really important changes that continued. So that, that was sort of the beginning of the doubling period, which didn't get really ingrained in Congress for a couple more years. But uh, uh, and I remember going with you to John Porter, the, the Congressman con Porter from Illinois, yeah. who was chair of the House Subcommittee right. on Appropriations. Yeah, I remember that experience very well. I think one of the things to bring out is how important the APS staff is, and you in particular, to to function of the APS. I mean, uh, presidents kind of come and go, and uh, it's you guys that deserve all the credit for making things happen. So that was, uh, uh, you know, it was a great pleasure working with you at that time. And, Same here. And, uh, um, Even if you beat me on the golf course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the other change that was beginning at that time, as you well know, is the publication mm -hmm. situation. And so we were facing at just the beginning of what was the electronic publication uh, that was starting at that time right. and and uh, you know it, APS has sort of been a, a leader in that and it, and I know a lot of discussions were taking place the year I was president as right. to how to deal with the changing environment in terms of electronic publications uh, publications for APS had been uh, very uh, uh, successful and uh, and they were th threatened by these changes and so uh, my hats off to you and <laughs> and subsequent presidents to survive the threat that came with electronic publication um, I think one of the other things that jumps out in my mind that we accomplished that year which is probably important in terms of programs that the APS supports is uh, there was a decision made at that time by council uh, to uh, be basically treat the reserve fund from the publications uh, as an endowment and then and, to and, uh, spend, I think, 5% with 4% uh, of that toward programs uh, that the APS wanted to provide for its membership. So. Um, that was an important accomplishment, I think. I, I will agree because it allowed us to create many more programs to give back some of the reserves to the members. So it was quite successful. And the other thing that stands out is we were able to convince council that Marty's ought to be paid like a uh, like uh, like he deserves. So. <laughs> well, in that regard, thank you very much. I appreciate that. While service is important, uh, as you suggested, uh, for a faculty member within a university or an association world, clearly the coin of the realm today is research. Okay, uh, you need to bring research dollars to an academic medical center. You've been very successful. Uh, you have one grant that is in its 44th year, another in the 46th, and last night you told me you got a dismal score on a grant <laughs> of a one, which I said was really disappointing. I thought mm -hmm. you could do at least much better than that. <laughs> yeah. 
But tell us, tell the listeners a little bit more about your research area, uh, how it developed. You've mentioned a number of people who were influential, but I think there's a lot more to be said. Well, I, I, there are two things that jump out uh, in my mind. Uh, I mentioned networking earlier, and clearly uh, uh, that networking and people, you know, being aware of your training and where you've been and what you've accomplished in your training is always important in terms of <clears throat> getting that initial funding. Um, the, what was, <clears throat> excuse me, my driving question was what I brought up earlier is uh, how do you prevent this or how does insulin work to prevent this muscle wasting and so um, I was again I think Howard Morgan was uh, influential in <clears throat> helping me learn how to do grant applications appropriately <laughs> or the right way and uh, and so the the thing that has driven my research is the, the big question and mm -hmm. what I see so much of these days with students and and it's frustrating is because they're focused what I call down in the weeds they're mm -hmm. uh, they're missing the big picture and uh, uh, you know research and medical research was originally driven by questions that came out of the clinic and so everybody in the years when I began training were really focused on problems that were clearly medically relevant and then um, you know we went through what I call a gene bashing era where we trained a bunch of tech junkies that, <laughs> <laughs> that we lost a generation I think because they learned how to sequence DNA or yeah I think in my view <clears throat> the important thing to when you're thinking about research is, um, you know, you've, I've heard the expression, uh, ask big audacious questions, but you should definitely have uh, what the thing that should drive your research is the question and not the technology. <clears throat> and so that's been my focus. The question I'm asking is the same one I started out asking. And so, uh, and I've adapted or adopted technology as it has become available to help answer that question which sort of moves you incrementally forward and uh, um, so that's to you know in terms of success I think that's that's really key is uh, uh, and obviously you have to be productive and and uh, but uh, I think being focused on what's important and being not afraid to fail <laughs> are two things because right now you know among the young trainees there's a dispirit the nature because they hear about the challenge of getting grants and they want they're not sure they want to pursue a career in science and uh, you know you, you have to be afraid to not afraid to fail and to go forward anyway. So. <clears throat> well, I, I will talk a little bit about that uh, and your thoughts about young aspiring scientists. But clearly, mm -hmm. at least based on my expectation, when you first came into science, some of the first meetings that you went to were probably in Atlantic City. And, yes. Uh, <laughs> fascinating. Uh, mm -hmm. Reflecting back on those days, how do you think scientific meetings have changed? Uh, I think a lot of our listeners won't remember the good old days. <laughs> the good old days. Well, my first uh, FASAB meeting was in Atlantic City in probably 1962, probably. I, uh, I was a second year graduate student, or, or I was between, well, I was second year in the MD PhD program. And, uh, it was the summer of that that okay. year that I went. Um, you know, Atlantic. Uh, you know, we drove from Nashville to Atlantic City, um, the boardwalk, the ocean. I've never seen the ocean before that. So, <laughs> um, it, and it was different in not only location and environment, but the size. I mean, and uh, uh, the and the the other difference I remember is that. Um, you know, the scientific community was smaller and the big names in the field were 
readily available and accessible as opposed to now where the meetings are so big and and sometimes the big names are not to be seen at the they helicopter and give their talk and leave. Correct, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the other difference is almost everything was platform sessions. Yes, yeah, that's a big difference, yes. At, at, at those early meetings. That was all platform. Now they're almost all poster sessions in Correct. part because of the growth of the community. That's exactly right. And I never really adapted well to posters. I never found it to be a efficient learning process. Um, okay. so. During your career, you've mentored a number of graduate students and postdocs, and obviously you mentor new faculty as they come in. Um, as such, what advice would you give to a student starting out today, and how would you help them to fulfill their aspirations? Well, the thing I look for most in uh, and a student is uh, to try to help them find out what their passion is. I mean, if you don't have a, a passion to do something, you're not likely to succeed at it. And mm -hmm. so, uh, and that's particularly true in, in science. I mean, you have to really love it and be excited by it and think about it when you're showering in the morning <laughs> and the whole thing. So, uh, passion is, uh, key, um, I think one of the things that some of my contemporaries were guilty of is wanting students to be a clone of themselves and my approach has always been to try to help students achieve what they really have the potential to do and, and, and in addition to the passion uh, you you need you know it, don't make it difficult for a student if they want to go from a research lab to a small liberal arts college to teach. I mean, you know, um, so I've really uh, promoted the idea that students should find what they love to do and then reach their full potential in doing that. Same way I treated office staff or or. or other young faculty members. Um, my graduates have gone, you know, one of my ex-students is a, a, a patent attorney in Chicago, extremely successful. And, mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, you don't have to become a clone of your, <laughs> of your advice or mentor. Um, well, I think uh, it's one of the challenges because we, many faculty, not yourself, uh, aren't prepared to allow their students to explore options. Uh, as we all know, a PhD gives you the critical thinking skills and problem solving ability to do anything you want to do. Exactly. So yeah. We've touched on a number of aspects of your career, Jim, uh, and uh, at least I've finished with the questions I had in mind, but are, think, are there things that you would like to share with our listeners about your career that I may not have asked you about? Well, I appreciate doing this, Marty, even though I've delayed doing it for about three years. <laughs> um, I think, uh, you know, these are, you know, I've come to realize these are very important uh, things to do to sort of preserve the history of the society. I think uh, if members are watching this, they need to understand how important it is to be involved with the APS and and to contribute because it is your community basically. And so, uh, and it's fun. Uh, <laughs> it, it wasn't too terrible of an interview. For you. <laughs> Jim, thanks for being part of the Society's Living History Program. On my own behalf, on behalf of the Society, I wanted to thank you. For sitting for this interview, I want to thank you for your many years of service to the society and hopefully many more years of interactions as we go forward. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here, Marty, and I really enjoyed it.